Bonjour tout le monde. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here. Uh, my uh, thanks to the, the forum, my thanks to Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada for putting on this session. It's really an exciting sector. It's, it's so much fun to watch the growth potential and Canada plays a leadership role in the world and we can do more. We're talking about billions and billions of dollars of opportunities in growth in the future, not just now, but the, in the Americas where I work. ICA is part of a, the Amer inter-American system. It's headquartered in Costa Rica. I'm the head of the Canadian delegation here in Canada. And there's so much interest, venture capitalists, there's so much interest by technology in all the 34 member states of the Americas. They look mostly to the US and Canada for leadership, for inspiration. We have three really strong thought leaders in this space with us today. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves quickly and tell us briefly why this sector is so attractive right now and in the future. Thanks, JC. Uh, so my name is John Cassidy. I'm Managing Director for SVG Ventures and Thrive based in Canada. Um, and we are a, an agri-food investor. So we invest in C to Series A um, companies in this space. Um, and what we try and do is surround our investments with value adds that increase the likelihood of success of the companies we invest in. So because we operate in, in an early stage, we have programs to sit beside our investments. So uh, we have three accelerator programs um, and those programs are really built on not teaching entrepreneurs how to be entrepreneurs. We're going to assume they already know that. They're mainly built to teach them how to build scalable businesses. Um, the other pillar that sits beside that is our corporate innovation program. So we have a team of consultants that work with the likes of uh, Bayer, Kubota, Yamaha, and many of the CEOs of these multinational organizations are thinking about two things. Number one is how do I be profitable as an organization? But number two is how do I be sustainable? Most importantly, mm. um, and the best way to do that is to be very, very aware of new technologies mm -hmm. that are that are breeding out of the out of the ecosystem. So our consultants work with them. They extract some of the problems that they're having and try and find solutions based on on our landscape maps that we Excellent. do. And then the four pillars that the ecosystem that we that that exists right now within within agri food. Like we're light years behind where we should be from a technology perspective. So um, we run major events globally. Uh, we partner with Forbes Media um, in 2014 and we joined founded the Forbes Ag Tech Summit. And the main reason we, we, we do that is that, like there aren't too many farmers hanging out in downtown San Francisco drinking cappuccinos. <laughs> and likewise, there aren't too many technologists hanging out in farms. So those that pillar has been hugely influential to drive some of the activity that mm. we have so we started this um 10 years ago in in silicon valley um and then we opened up a, an accelerator um in salinas valley uh, at that time at that time salinas valley was experiencing lots of labor shortages um technology wasn't really our ag tech wasn't really i don't think the phrase was even coined at, at, at that time and uh -huh. um and then two years ago we set up our canadian subsidiary we are quite bullish on Canada um, and the opportunity that exists here, hence why we're here now and we have a team of, of 13 spread across the country. Fantastic. Alison. Uh, my name is Alison Sundstrom. I am the true nerd on this team. <laughs> uh, I founded or co-founded a uh, company back in 1999, which uh, built a data acquisition and analytics platform to inform uh, genomics. I scaled my company around the world. Uh, we took it to most of the major universities in Canada and across the world to use my technology. And then we started installing on farms and ranches. In 2019, I divested my company to a UK private wealth firm. And I had an excellent exit, but I own 94% of the company when I exited. And that's a conversation about the kind of why. And there were two things that I saw were problematic. Num number one was access to capital in Canada to grow a business. Good businesses can always access capital, but at what cost? And the second thing was how do you commercialize? How do you commercialize at scale? There's a real difference between invention and innovation and startup and scale up. And so I found the Creative Destruction Lab and I, I wanted to highlight it 
Uh, the Creative Destruction Lab came out of the University of Toronto in 2012. It's now grown around the world. It's a nine month program that assists entrepreneurs. It provides them with uh, access to scientists, access to technology, access to mentors who have scaled their companies and grown them and exited them successfully. It's a phenomenal program to help an entrepreneur get across the line. The um, program has been so successful. It's now in 12, um, 12 institutions around the world. It must be partnered with a top tier university, London, Oxford, uh, London, Oxford, Paris, Heck. Uh, we just opened in Estonia and also opened in Berlin and we're across Canadian universities. Since our startup, we have raised 22 billion in equity. 2,400 entrepreneurs have, have gone through our program, and that's about 6,000 founders, and we're just on a rocket ship. So I'm very proud that I am the founding partner of, of the agricultural stream of CDL. I made a personal investment to stand that up, and I think there's nothing more exciting than agriculture. Let me tell you what the opportunity is. We are the number five producer of goods in the world. We are the number eight exporter of goods. And the United States is number one. But the Netherlands, a country the size of Banff National Park, or GTA, is the second largest exporter of goods. Our opportunity, given that we produce as much as we do, given many, many headwinds and many, many tailwinds, we have a superior opportunity and love to unpack that for you today. Well, uh, thanks, Alison. Thanks, uh, GC. Um, my name is Mike McGee. I'm the uh, National Director of Innovation for Bioenterprise Canada. We're a not-for-profit uh, that's been around for 19 years, uh, based uh, here in Ontario, in Guelph. Um, we would characterize ourselves as an accelerator. Uh, our primary mission is to help uh, commercialize agritech businesses. Uh, we do so through administering uh, various non-dilutive uh, funding programs, typically ranging from fifty to one hundred thousand uh, dollars, requiring matching contribution from the companies that we help in commercializing their technologies. Uh, we have a group of uh, 14 innovation advisors across the country, as well as a scientific uh, science and advisory council of 20 members, again, across the country from various academic institutions who avail themselves to our members uh, uh, to uh, provide mentorship, uh, coaching, scientific advice, anything that's required to help them get that business commercialized and developed far enough along so they can approach folks like Allison and, uh, and John uh, for funding. Um, I think one of the reasons that agriculture is so exciting, we've heard that it represents 7% of our GDP, but it also represents 16% of our exports. Uh, most folks are aware that uh, by 2050, we're supposed to have a global population of $9.5 billion. And it's estimated that uh, we would need an increase in food production of 60% in order to feed the world by 2050. Um, the other element that's very critical, obviously Canada is very blessed with land, um, a highly educated workforce, very productive farmers, uh, but agriculture also has an impact on the environment. Agriculture is estimated to generate 25 to 35 percent of greenhouse gas emissions and uses 40 percent of the world's fresh water. So in the context of global climate change and uh, developing more regenerative, sustainable ag, without agriculture being part of the solution, it's going to be very difficult to achieve the objectives that we've set for ourselves. So our collective roles amongst ourselves is to try and find those technologies that allow farmers to do more with less. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Mike. I want to work off one of the elements you raised is on commercialization. What is today's potential for existing tech? Maybe explain what the existing tech is and then talk about potential most promising future tech that's coming up. I'll start with you. 
Thanks, JC. Um, the evolution of technology, uh, as you probably well know, we, we've uh, had uh, the introductions of uh, pesticides in the past, fertilizer, NPK, which allowed yields, for example, on corn to go from 50 bushels an acre to over 300 bushels an acre. So a lot of these technologies that, that helped uh, allow us to produce more and, and reduce food costs um, obviously have a environmental impact. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest challenges in agriculture now is the shortage of labor. So I can speak specifically to the fact that one of the areas that's of particular interest to us is anything that reduces uh, the need for labor. Uh, you may be aware of uh, a technology called auto steer, which was introduced about 20 years ago that allowed basically combines and tractors to drive uh, across fields in a highly efficient manner, uh, allowing farmers to, uh, I would say, multitask. So anything that, that enhances um, uh, labor efficiency, anything that, that results in the reduction of application of traditional ag chems, which of course is better for the environment, less runoff, things like uh, low compaction technologies, things like cover crops to allow for the sequestration of more carbon in the soil. These are all areas that, that, that are of particular interest to us, but there's a plethora of them that I'm sure uh, Allison and, and, uh, and John can uh, speak to as well. Please, Alice. So I'm more interested in the technologies of the future, and uh, I see great potential. We have the nine and a half billion population that you were referring to, we have an opportunity that looks like $12, million, $12 trillion over the next 25 years. Agriculture globally is an $8 trillion industry today. It's moving into that $12 trillion uh, zone with the increase in population. But what agriculture has done, and if any of you have ever seen Ken Burns' documentary on uh, the Great Plow Up, we have really impacted, and I'd like to challenge your statistics a little bit. Agriculture uses 70% of the world's fresh water, and it accounts for 24% of greenhouse gases. So if we're going to double production on the same or likely less land, we're de we are constantly urbanizing our farming country. If we're going to make that possibility. We have to do so sustainably, and we have to do so in a manner that improves our population. There was a really great statement, and I'm sorry I don't know who made it, but we're nine meals away from anarchy. <laughs> and if you had looked at what happened during, um, during the pandemic with supply shocks, runs on toilet paper, if you can't access food, this is something that becomes a great security risk. And with two of our global super agriculture powerhouses, having these two countries duke it out, food insecurity around the world is very, very real. So my interest is in the future technologies that are gonna reimagine everything we do today. That drives down to synthetic biology, cellular agriculture, the ways that we can really respond. And if you want to know what those technologies are, if you know how beer is manufactured, it's the same kind of processes with a little more technology on the back end. So precision fermentation, creating new proteins, new materials, new ways to feed, clothe, and fuel us. Yeah, I, I think just building on what Alison said there, I think, you know, COVID probably, probably shone a light on some of uh, the new technologies that we're looking at, uh, one being the area of control environment agriculture. So we work with an organization headquartered in the US called Plenty. Um, they're a vertical farm um, uh, unicorn. Um, and I think when you look at a, at a country like, like Canada, I think Canada, I'll correct my stats if I'm wrong here, but it imports about, it imports about 80% of, it, of its fresh fruit and veg. Hmm. Um, uh, which means that right now the majority of that 80 percent is is from the us which means that canadians spend a lot more money um on those products that, that than americans do and then when we 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 work with um organizations like sobeys here as well i think when COVID hit 
you know, a lot of their supply came from Driscoll Berries, for example. So when border issues mm -hmm. are, are difficult, that places huge impacts on what's coming on those shelves and the timing and the time frames and they come in. So the idea that, um, you know, farms can be placed beside retail stores, which is happening in the Middle East right now quite a, 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 at high scale, mm -hmm. um, can also happen here. There's it, what we're seeing from an application perspective from our accelerator, for example, is there's quite a, a big cluster of vertical farm organizations, mm -hmm. but also new technologies um, that are looking to potentially utilize old oil plants or, or um, 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 to facilitate some of that growth and to make it sustainable. Um, that's one area we're looking at right now, uh -huh. but quite strongly. Another area is around data, right? So we've a, we've a lot of um, technologies, particularly around um, AI and how it detects diseases and whatnot. But there's a lot of data coming from um, those technologies. And I think the beauty of data um, and the secret sauce behind that is be, being able to articulate it and uh, formulate it in an actionable manner. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at that for the insure tech, um, or now they're coining it the agri insure tech and agri fintech area. So being able to underwrite risk at animal level um, and being able to do it at scale. So we're, there's a few companies in Canada doing that right now. And then those two areas mm -hmm. we're, we're looking at quite strongly. And personally for me, um, um, I think they could be quite impactful in this country and we're very excited about that. Exciting, yeah. yeah. Um, to help the room a bit understand, you may heard some terms like food insecurity and it's a, it's a concept that is not always misunderstood. You understand hunger probably. And the WFP, the World Food Program, will tell you that they're serving, in terms of famine, they, like the, the very people who need the most food, the, the food now. It's, um, it's a sort of question of survival. It's about 345 million people in the world. The FAO and the UN talks about the food insecure. So it's a bit question of availability, economic access, physical access to the food. That's another, maybe around 800 to a billion people. But in truth, if you look at all multiple factors beyond availability of food, because the FAO will say there's none in Canada. We have 3,400 kilocalories available per day, and we only need 2,200 for men and 1,800 women. So there's enough food in Canada, there should be no hunger. So in their interpretation, there's zero hunger here. But in most of the world, it's actually around 30%. And in Latin America, where I work, it's about 40%. Most of the people now with COVID, with the supply chain shocks, everything, it's, it's increased and it's more women and it's more children. So it, it's a challenge. Ag tech is part of the solution. It helps with productivity. It helps with uh, reducing the environmental impact. And you know, everything we do, our, each mouthful is food system transformation. That's demand pressure on supply. And so ag tech supports solutions on supply. And I'd like to ask the, the panel how they see ag tech as part of the solution to these global challenges right now. Alison, please. Sure. Um, first off, and I like the way you put it, agriculture is part of the problem, but it's also part of the solution. When you're trying to reduce impact, I'll give you an example, and I'd like to pick up on your data point if I could. Yep. So my tagline for my company was uh, measure, monitor, predict, mitigate, and optimize. And as of late, I've add, added automate to the end of that. For us to deploy AI and other, um, other machine learning type of methods, we need to collect a lot of data and we need to turn some things um, into insight or foresight so that we can automate. If we can automate um, our food processing um, centers, we are going to reduce uh, emissions significantly. If we can take our livestock industry and genomically enhance the way that they convert feed, we will reduce emissions. The potential to reduce emissions exists today, and we could reduce emissions from agriculture by about 71% over the next 25 years if we deployed the technology we have today and those technologies of the future. So we do, we are able to make that change. Now, climate impact, what the effect of climate on agriculture is huge. We've lost 27% of our productivity since 1961. And as, as we were saying, we have to double food production to meet our growing population demand. So I think technology is the most exciting way we can meet our, our global challenges. 
and I think it goes into our future technologies. Thanks. Anybody else? John, Mike? I was so engrossed with what she's saying, I've forgotten your question, so you'll have to re review. Well, how ag tech can be part of the solution to these global development challenges with the world is a... Yeah, I think, um, um, I think people for, for forget how important agriculture is sometimes. You know, we don't need, we don't need Ethereum to survive. <laughs> we, need, we need food. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, some of the challenges, let's say, that we've had from, from, from the Ukraine and Russia situation right. really put a spotlight on, on prices. And, mm -hmm. and um, not many people knew that Ukraine was the breadbasket of Europe. That's right. Um, but they do now. Um, and I think that I heard a stat um, only recently that about because of the, the war um, that's going on right now, mm -hmm. kind of feels like we're back in the 1940s, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But it, um, about 7 million people will die in Africa. We can afford to absorb those prices. Here, yes. Some people can't. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and I think it's, there's responsibility from all of our organizations up here um, to be very responsible about where they're putting investment dollars, but also there's a government role to play there in terms mm -hmm. of reducing risk for, for adoption and, mm -hmm. uh, and whatnot. So um, I hope that answers your question, but I think that's probably areas that, that we're kind of looking at right now. Mike, did you want to answer? I would just add, I mean, the uh, discussion this morning at 7.30, Bill Gruel from Protein Industry Canada was one of the panelists, and I think the federal government's identified uh, plant-based protein as, as one of the key areas that we really can excel and export to the world, uh, reducing the need for a traditional uh, animal-based protein. People will always probably want to have their steak and whatnot, but particularly in third world countries, um, the the... the I think Canada is very well positioned mm -hmm. to have that as a major uh, growth in exports to feed the world from a technology perspective. You know, John uh, is in an, involved with a global uh, organization, so we're going to continue developing technologies in Canada with the ecosystem that we have that's very supportive, programs like IRAP, uh, mm -hmm. SHRED, the universities, etc., and eventually a lot of those technologies will find their way to other markets, South America, where you're focused, JC, mm -hmm. that will hopefully enhance their yields and allow them to be more efficient. We work from Canada to Argentina and the, and the Caribbean, so in 34 member countries. And we did an assessment, we were looking at land degradation. Over half the land in the Americas is considered degraded now. It's a risk to food insecurity in the future, not only today. So to, to get to the 9.5 billion you were mentioning, it's, there's, a great, there's a large concern because the Americas are a breadbasket for the world. And Canada is among the lead, as Alison was saying, and pointing out, fifth largest exporter in the planet. And so, I'm, you were talking about government, and I'd like to talk about the regulatory environment. And any other challenges you see that are maybe constraining Canada's potential, and maybe changes we can make to be optimal. So, I, I asked Jean Charles if we could raise this point. Good. And uh, I have an opinion that government, um, I think government has a role to play, but government will not solve our problems. And I would say there's a couple of things we have to do. Number one, we have to recognize what an opportunity agriculture is. And I'll go back to why the Netherlands is so successful. Number one, they have a great transportation infrastructure, but also they have really good financial structuring within the European Union, access to markets, but we have access to one of the biggest markets in the world, in North America and South America. So we have access. What we need to do is stand up and say, we are an agricultural nation. The Rabobank, which is a global bank, very, very important in the structure of agriculture economics, started out as a credit union and they grew and they focused on agriculture. So we need to do one thing. We need to stand up and say, we are an agricultural nation. We understand the opportunity. The second thing is we really have to start attacking this conversation. And by that, I mean, we have to get the financing. You mentioned a few government programs for startups. Why I owned 94% of my company when I exited is because I could not get access to capital. So I did become a venture capitalist and I am a venture partner at Builders VC out of San Francisco with 500 million assets under management. 
But one of the things, access to capital, and we've talked about inclusion through this entire conference, we have to recognize that there is an opportunity to have inclusive growth. And I am a general partner of the 51, which is focused on funding outliers, those diverse founders, female-led companies, and diverse founders that are really focusing on improving agriculture. So we have to improve our access to capital. And the people that are sitting up here are all involved in that process. But we do need to start looking at where do we bring large dollars to transform an industry like agriculture takes large dollars. Mm. Our pension funds have 15% of Canada's wealth, about three and a half trillion dollars. They are investing in some of those future technologies. We need to encourage them to make their investments at home. So we're transforming our technology here. So there's many things that we have to do, but I would say don't rely on the government. We have to use tax levers, incentive, creative capital that can see us expand our opportunity. Yeah, I would say I would say a few things. We did a we did a, a farmer study um, in the United States a couple of years ago, um, and one aspect of the study was around. Uh, trust. So it was a farmer study and it was a trust tree at the top of the tree. So the people they, they trust the most was the agronomist. Um, the middle is, is corporates like John Deere's and, and, and the large scale organizations and, and right down at the bottom of the tree um, was startups. Because in many ways, the producer and the farmer, they're the ones taking the risk. Mm -hmm. um, and, it's a, and if something happens or something fails, which in many times with startups do, um, uh, the, you know, it's, it's, it's a cost for them, you know what I mean? So policies need to be in place from government to allow farmers to adopt technology at a cost-effective effective manner. That's number one. I would say number two would be, as Alison said there, keeping entrepreneurs, getting them the right access to the amount of funding, so large-scale funding, but also keeping the entrepreneurs here. So one example I, I often use is Garrett Kemp, he's the co-founder of Uber. Mm -hmm. He came out of the University of Calgary. Um, he couldn't get the funding that he needed um, in this country, so he had to go elsewhere, and he went to he went to the states. Um, it would be great if that company was now headquartered in Calgary or somewhere else in, in Canada. That cannot happen in this industry. Um, we don't need our best minds and 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 the best people behind our industry to go elsewhere. Um, we have to keep them here, and the only way we'll keep them here is if they have the right access to funding. And then leading on to that, I think. You know, we're raising a fund right now. Um, we're almost at our first close. And we've spent the last year and a half going to different provincial government uh, uh, funds that participate um, in, many, in, many, um, in many funds. And uh, the exercise has been interesting for us. You know, when we come in, it's, it's hard to get, to get in their calendar. It's hard to, you know, if you look at Ontario Grow Capital, if you look at Alberta Enterprise Corp in BC, we're a US fund that want to place ourselves in mm. Canada. And it's very difficult for us to speak to these guys. And some of them have their own sets of rules and regulations around where capital is deployed or where the fund manager eats cornflakes on a Monday morning. It's, um, and I think it would be great if some of these organizations work together. Mm -hmm. um, but also one role which I think some of these organiza organizations need is head of business development. Mm -hmm. So someone actually going to Sand Hill Road mm -hmm. or going to the Middle East and knocking on their door saying, hey, when are you raising your next fund? And how about you place it in Canada, and here's what we can do for you in order to make that happen. Um, so yeah, I could go on about this, but I, I, I uh, but there would be probably the three things. Fantastic. I think. Well, we do have 24 minutes, and I, yeah, I'd like to add. There, there's a bit of an elephant in the room, I, I think, when it comes to investing in ag. And Mohammed from Aspire spoke to it a little this morning, and that that is agriculture is very different. It's not fintech. It, it's not software margins. Uh, you know, if you look at the food industry, the consumer packaged good industry, you know, the Loblaws of the world, margins generally run anywhere from two and a half to four percent. Um, you know, in, in agriculture, you're dependent so much on Mother Nature. There's so many variables that come into play in terms of impacting yield. And capital is free to go anywhere at once. And, and obviously, we've seen return in different areas, whether it was Bitcoin a year ago or otherwise. And so for agriculture to attract capital, 
obviously you have to be generating the types of return to, to, to offset the risk. And I think we need to change our mindset a little. I think we need to take a little bit more of an impact investor approach to investing in agriculture. And that is recognizing you're not necessarily going to get uh, 10x or 100x uh, return on your investment. Maybe those investors that invested with you, Allison, did. But by and large, there aren't a lot of examples of that. So I think what you have to look at is longer term, the multiplier effect, the, the benefit to the environment, which is really hard to measure, mm -hmm. uh, the, the benefit of food security, right? Mm -hmm. we, we saw with COVID how important that has become, um, and health outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the end of the day, you know, as uh, we're increasingly driven by, at least in the, in the developed world, by consumers that are looking to eat healthier, uh, how, do you, how do you measure the impact of the fact you're going to have fewer people with uh, diabetes for a, a less incidence of child obesity because they're eating better. So mm -hmm. I really think that, that investors looking at this space have to look at more of the, the long-term benefits associated that aren't necessarily as measurable as, you know, return on, straight return on capital. Right. So I disagree. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I disagree because I think that if we have an exciting market space, if we have a market that I'm speaking about to $12 trillion, we can drive both superior financial returns and we can drive positive social and environmental outcome. Now, I do agree with you. I'm, I'm kind of taking a bit of a pot shot at you. <laughs> and I'd also say to you that that's the role of a VC. You got to get out there and knock on every door. But I do think that this opportunity is a financial opportunity. There are long horizons. There are risks within agriculture, but this is a marketplace that is showing finance or financial returns. Ag tech didn't really exist as a space until about 2012 with the first launch of the Monsanto kind of takeover of climate court. But over the last years since that time, this industry or the investments in, in uh, in food and agriculture, ag tech alone, have been growing at a CAGR of 45%. We're seeing this with all the other downturns in the financial markets. We're seeing that this is still an area that people want to invest in. Now you're right, it's not FinTech. FinTech is about seven times the size of food and agriculture, but it's an exciting space to be in and investing in. Mm. And I will drive financial returns. That's bottom line. So where are we seeing this right now in terms of interests? When you're trying to approach different techs, it could be anything from, I, lots of people talk about blockchain, not necessarily applicable. It could be Internet of Things, could be Precision Ag, could be, and the topic today is automation and robotics. So where are you seeing the greatest interest or potential right now? Or are they leaning towards new tech that isn't really available yet? I would say that some of the most significant investments are being made in cellular agriculture, in areas of synthetic biology, and these are large bets being made. So that's one area. I think that IoT, we're into generation 2.0. And on automation, this is a tech, automation is what we need today. It's very exciting. It's about an 85 billion marketplace by 2028. However, it's something we need today. And I loved what you said about we need to get people adopting technology. If you take a look at OECD stats on business expenditures on research and development, and I use that as kind of a litmus test, we have been declining since the 70s. Our manufacturing is out of date. So we really need to invest here. And we could be doing something like a scientific research and, and experimental development credit to reward or benefit people adopting new technologies. So those are the places that government could play a role. Mm. John, Mike? Yeah, I think um, one of the things I've said in the panel earlier on this morning was ag tech isn't sexy. And I, I really huh. drives me mad when people say that because Beyond Meat didn't exist, um, what, 11 years ago? Yeah. 
the IPO it after seven years for 3.7 billion, and as of when in 2019 they were worth about 11 billion. That's pretty sexy to me, yeah. to be honest. Um, but I think um, I'll go back some to some of the technology that I spoke about earlier on. You mentioned there that blockchain doesn't really um, fit into this industry. It actually does. Um, a lot of there's a, there's a lot of um, particularly in Latin America. Um, you know, small scale, small scale farmers are utilizing blockchain chains technology to, to sell their produce um, at a fair market price. Mm. And there's platforms out there that are enabling them to do that. Mm. And quite frankly, you know, the, you know, our middle class is exploding. Um, people are now very much concerned and very much aware of the food that they're eating. Mm -hmm. like, like 10, 15 years ago, everything, number one was taste. Taste is not the most important factor anymore of your mm -hmm. food. It's actually where that food comes from mm -hmm. um, and how good it is to put it put in our body. Food is medicine. Mm -hmm. um, so areas around kind of like new ways of, of generating food mm -hmm. um, at a more sustainable way. Um, that's probably from an investment perspective mm -hmm. that, that, that we're looking at. But I go back again around, around CEA, I think around 7.5 billion in the last five years. Wow was put into Canadian agri-food tech companies. And a, and a good portion of that um, was put around control environment agriculture technology. So when I say control environment agriculture, even within vertical farming, there's tons of technologies uh, where they'd they be lighting, picking technology so that mm -hmm. they don't need humans to, to, to inter interact with some of the products. Um, it's, and there's a cluster um, um, mm -hmm. involved in, in Canada as well. So those industries would be pretty sexy. Yeah, <laughs> I be. agree. I, you know, I, I agree with Allison that in, in terms of biologicals, I think there's a tremendous potential for growth as we increasingly understand the microbiome, the soil, mm -hmm. uh, and, and how to ensure we have healthy soil. Uh, the other area that, uh, that I think has a lot of potential is actually gene editing, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 and other technologies. You know, GMO is a sensitive uh, topic for sure, uh, but I think gene editing offers an opportunity to, to uh, create crops um, that are more resistant to drought, uh, you know, more resistance to bugs, etc. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to overcome the objection of uh, a lot of uh, folks to the concept of GMO, but I think it offers a lot of potential uh, down the road. Uh, we touched on controlled environment ag. Um, you know, I think it's a wonderful space, but, but if you look at a lot of the companies out there, very capital intensive, significant amount of losses uh, in order to get the companies to a stage where they're actually generating a return on investment. So one of the challenges we have in Canada is we don't have a lot of large funds. It's mostly smaller funds. Mm -hmm. And I think there has to be greater collaboration amongst the small funds and the various uh, organizations involved in the ecosystem to help uh, you know, find those uh, management teams and companies to back and work collectively to ensure the best of the best are the ones that we invest in and, and succeed. And collaboration amongst groups like Thrive, the 51 ourselves, and many others in the ecosystem, uh, including academic organizations, I think is critical to identifying those and, and moving them forward uh, to become major corporations, not just mm -hmm. you know niche $50 million businesses. Not that there's anything wrong with $50 million businesses, because we all know the lifeblood of Canada's economy is companies with fewer than 50 employees. Maybe we could pick up on that a bit if we could. Um, so SMEs in Canada employ 85% mm -hmm. of our population. I'm gonna give you something, C.D. Howe just put out a paper this past week, which really highlights a problem we have in Canada. The spread, the interest spread. So let's drive up, let's pull up from venture capital because that's only a small part of our financing across Canada. Um, the interest spread between a small and large business in Canada is about two and a quarter percent. In the United States, it's a quarter percent. So our SMEs are disadvantaged in, in, in interest rates. Now here's another little problem is our next peer in this not so good list is Australia and there's 61 basis points ahead of us. So we need to take some of the risk out of capital to our businesses. We need to have a different kind of venture debt structure in Canada. And we really need, this is about all businesses, not just food and egg. We really need to create a better spectrum of capital 
to grow our country. Want to pick up on that? No, I think what she, what she said is totally right. It's, it's what we need. One call I'd have to say is um, we're, we're, we're doing better than we were last year and we're doing better than we were the year before. I think that's important to note. And some of the stats that the CVCA have highlighted around venture capital and private equity, we are, and there's a lot more new funds popping up um, around the 50 million mark, and many of them will, will get the 50 million, they'll deploy, they'll deploy about 75% of it, and then they'll go for a bigger fund. So um, um, I, think, I think we'll get there in time. But one organization that I think we have to call out is Farm Credit Canada. Farm Credit Canada have been hugely influential in the growth of venture capital um, um, in, in this space, and they've been phenomenally successful in doing so. When you look at the reports, mm -hmm. they started this strategy a couple of years ago, and look what's happened. Yeah. Um, I don't think a panel like this would even exist without them. So um, um, I hope someone from FCC is in the room, but I think they're, they've been hugely influential in, in getting gears going, and I continually see that happening. Significant player. Huge. Yeah, $5 billion recently. Yeah. yeah. Well, they go beyond venture capital. Yeah. Right. I think that's the point that needs to be made. They're actually a relatively new player in the fund of funds uh, outside of what you formally did with FCC. We need, though, we need uh, the, the largest agricultural bank in Canada, but we need that bank to be global. So FCC needs to be a global player like Rabobank and others, and we can do this. Just a little constraint on uh, it constraint on it but we always have to remember we are global players and so i just wanted to focus back on that that's a great idea please mike yeah i, I just like to add uh, and I, again it was such on the panel this morning i mean traditional funds with limited partners and general partners usually have a five to seven year life they can extend beyond that but certainly my experience in investing is it takes a lot longer to build a, an ag tech or a food tech company. And, and the reality is, is in the first couple of years when you raise your money, you're trying to deploy it as quickly as possible. And then you're already thinking about how do I get these exits for the company so I can go and raise my next fund. I need to have shown returns like Allison and Thrive in order to raise the next fund. But in many cases, the problem is the company hasn't developed uh, along quickly enough to be able to sell it at a significant lift. So I think one of the key things that folks that are looking uh, you know, at encouraging investment into space is to have a longer investment horizon mm -hmm. in, in the funds that are focused on agriculture and whether mm -hmm. that's allowing for a, a, you know, extension of the fund for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. um, the reality of b investing in the space is when you're a small fund, unless you can follow on in each subsequent round of investment, there's a tendency to get diluted. So the challenge is, you know, we don't have large funds with deep pockets. Maybe that's not a bad thing because we can go to uh, a lot of foreign investors to come in with deeper pockets and then mm -hmm. invest in the more capital intensive businesses. But I think we need a uh, to, to practically acknowledge that it's going to take longer and more capital uh, for agriculture by virtue of uh, uh, the idiosyncrasies of the business mm -hmm. uh, in order to generate an exit, whether it's a sell uh, to Telus Ag or well, uh, you know, to, uh, to one of the big uh, ag uh, corporates out there. Well, I think we're focusing on venture capital. We're getting quite deep because we're VCs, but we have to learn how to, I kept 94% of my business because I grew from cash flow derived from operations, I found customers. And so I think that's, that's another point we have to make is that if you've got a great technology, if you can find the customers, if you can find the corporations, I think that's what you need to do within this industry. And that's where a good venture capitalist or a good funder or a good accelerator can assist you in those processes. Um, every business, if you take a look at Apple, if you take a look, every business takes 20 years to be great. You don't get good businesses overnight. And so it's no different in egg. But if you take a look at every successful business, there's a few examples that have been overnight successes that haven't, you know, that overnight success after 20 years of research and development is really what it takes. But R&D's declined here. I can't stand this, Jean-Charles. That's something that upsets me deeply. 
and business expenditures on research and development. But one thing where we rank very high, and if you look at the OECD stats, we're right up there with the United States, is percentages of researchers per capita. We have a strong science and technology uh, across Canada. We just don't have a very good reputation at commercializing mm -hmm. our inventions and keeping them here. So we can make a change to this. And several of the things that we talked about today are things that could change. A lot of people in the Americas, when they talk to me about Canada, they say, canola. Yep. Absolutely. And, and you know, it took 40 years. Yes, and Dr. Wilf Keller is a mentor at CDL, and he was the grandfather mm -hmm. of canola. If we take a look at some of our scientists, we have rock stars. Dr. Michael Houghton, uh, Nobel Prize winner, University of Alberta. We can just look across the spectrum. He's working on mRNA vaccines. It, his Nobel Prize was for um, just discoveries that can be used in many of our industries and in agriculture as well. So we have incredible science and technology. We have will, we have wonderful accelerators. We just have to say, hey, we're an agricultural nation. Yeah. We're gonna fund it and we're gonna move it. Yeah, I'd just like to add, I mean, I, we're doing some things right. For example, the recent announcement of, of seven uh, trial farms across the country. Olds College is probably one of the leaders, at least in, in Western Canada in that area. And anybody looking to commercialize an ag technology needs customers, right? Uh, depending on whether TL1 or TRL1 or, or through to TRL7, and I won't go into the description of what that means. Uh, but the reality is, is as we have more uh, smart farms, Mm -hmm. where people can trial their technology mm -hmm. without having to convince a farmer to adopt a technology that he's not sure he's going to get a return on investment. I mean, uh, farming is a, a you know, a, as I alluded to earlier, a high risk venture with all the variables that come into play. So he may not want to put, you know, four acres of what he's growing at risk with a new technology may, that may negatively impact his yield. Mm -hmm. So I think the increased collaboration between academic uh, institutions, uh, smart farms, uh, the accelerators, uh, pre-accelerators, the incubators, uh, the investment that's been made across the country in those, I, I think really bodes well for you know moving up the 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 uh, the, uh, the percentage. I think we were last 21st or 23rd in the commercialization of mm -hmm. uh, of technology, according to Dominic Barton's report, to 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 a space where we actually belong or should belong, which is significantly higher, lower in percentage, higher in the ranking. Last year when I was here at the TGF, the President of Columbia was giving a talk and he said, what we need more is sustainability. And, uh, so technology and sustainability. But in Canada, you're going to find a lot of farmers may not, don't have the business risk savviness and are hesitant. And the most profitable farms are usually 250 to 500,000. So they're quite small before they do any R&D. Right. Manufacturing Canada at the peak was 250 million a year, now it's dropped to like 125. There are labor shortages. How do we track, what's the criteria that you need to, to in, inspire, innovate? What's the, mark, what's the sales pitch that you give? How do we foster adoption? By providing return on investment. And that's the big focus. If your technology returns, then you will get adopted. And so you need to prove that, the trial farm's one way, but with data today, you can deploy technology on any farm, anywhere, and demonstrate how you can actually make change. And I would say that some of my customers were um, 60 to 80 years old, and they were adopting. Wow. So you have to prove ROI, uh -huh. simple. I think a big marketing exercise needs to, needs to go into, I think there is like, Agriculture, especially in the last couple of years, has got some bad press. Uh -huh. and, and in my opinion, it hasn't been, some of the stats have been a bit off, I, uh -huh. I, I think. And I think that, um, you know, for Canada specifically, I remember the first time I came to Canada, I attended an agri-food summit. Before I came, I, I read the RBC Farmer uh, 4.0 report. Yeah. I'd read Alberta's recovery plan. I'd read a few, a few reports to get me um, um, up to speed on the country. Um, 
and the keyword that Alison said was global about you know, yeah. you know thinking global. And the event that I was at, I was blown away by some of the um, technologies I saw mm -hmm. and some of the the stats that I heard about Canada and the, mm -hmm. and, the and the agriculture ecosystem that exists here. But I was honestly, out of 1,500 people, I was the most foreign person in the room. And it felt like Canada was talking to Canada. Yeah. Or in that case, Alberta was talking to Alberta. Yeah. Well, it should be, Canada should be talking to the world. You yeah. know what I mean? And I think that, you know, from, from a country where I'm from, we kind of oversell ourselves um, um, in that aspect. But there's plenty of things that go on in this country, like Stampede in, mm -hmm. in, in, in Calgary or things that are going on in, mm -hmm. in Ontario that allow major companies to come to Canada and see what's going on here. And I just think that um, marketing can play a big role there as well. Um, but ROI is obviously very, very, very important. Good argument. Uh, 100%, I think ROI is critical, but I also think it's sometimes more difficult in proving ROI mm -hmm. statistically from a significance perspective. I mean, uh, agriculture in particular, we've, you know, we've got a four month growing season. If you miss the window in that year to trial your product, you're mm -hmm. waiting another eight months before you get an opportunity. So by virtue of the very nature of the seasonality of the business, it takes longer you know, to, to uh, develop your technology. Uh, the other element I would talk about is scalability, right? Uh, at the end of the day, you know, a lot of companies that that uh, that uh, develop models, uh, Farmers Business Network comes to mind. Um, you know, realized after a while that actually you need boots on the ground. Uh, you need uh, you know not only distribution, but you need folks out there advocating for your product. You know, taking on the role that the traditional agronomist would do for at the local crop supply store, and that's expensive. It takes a while if you've got a very technical sale for an agronomist or mm -hmm. one of your salespeople to convince a buyer the sales cycle is long. Yeah. I'm not suggesting you can't uh, overcome the length of it and generate that return, but invariably, again, it extends the period of time uh, that it requires often to get traction. 30 seconds each, Brian will say. Um, one thing I would say is, Listen to Alison. <laughs> Alison is is uh, she's travels all around. I see her speaking at events all over North America. She's been there. She's done it, um, and she knows what she's talking about um, a lot better than people that I've met. So I've listened to her. She knows. I'll, I'll use the fifteen seconds you haven't used to give it to Alison. Yeah, for yeah. 40%. <laughs> well, that was quite an endorsement. Thank you. <laughs> Invest in agriculture. Understand the great opportunity, and really, you eat every day. It is, an, it is an opportunity you do understand. I, I don't think I can add anything. I think it's a, it's a great space uh, to, to invest in. I do think you can get returns. And I think we have to look at the, uh, the importance of agriculture in its uh, role to reduce uh, GHG emissions. And whether it's 70% of the world's water or 40%, I'm not going to debate that. Uh, <laughs> at, at the end of the day, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an exciting space. And you, I hope you could see the excitement amongst the panelists today that we have and our colleagues share for, uh, for the space. Please join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>